Welcome everybody and apologies for the uh, technical difficulties which meant we're starting the session late. We have a very exciting session today. Um, I am Mary De Silva. I've recently started at the Department of Health and Social Care as a Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor. And this session we're going to be learning uh, is all about learning from and moving forward from COVID in terms of what we've learned from um, health, for, uh, health data research. The aims of the session are firstly to reflect on the lessons learned on health data research through the COVID pandemic. Secondly, to identify critical developments that have enabled the health and data research uh, during the pandemic and to consider how we work to retain these in the future. And thirdly, to discuss how we can use our expertise and experience to provide resilience to future health shocks. No doubt all of us bear the scars of COVID, but this is going to be a positive session and not so much lamenting what went wrong, but celebrating what went well and what we can move forward with. Just as in Japan, where broken bowls are mended with gold, learning from the scars that we all acquired um, is really important to move forward. So I really want us to focus on the positives of how we can cement what worked during COVID into, room, into uh, not enabling, enabling us not just to prepare better for the future, but also to make business as usual better. We've got a fabulous panel to discuss this. We've got Simon Ball, who's the Executive Medical Director at University Hospitals Birmingham. We've got Lynn Laidlaw, who's a public and patient representative and also a health researcher. And also Professor Dame Jenny Harries, Chief Executive of the health, uh, UK Health Security Agency. And I'll introduce each speaker in a bit more detail um, just before their talk. Each person is going to speak for about seven minutes, uh, leaving us lots of time for questions and discussion at the end of the session. So first of all, I'm really uh, pleased to introduce Simon Ball. Uh, he's a consultant nephrologist in Birmingham and also research director of the HGR UK Midlands Centre and leads the HGR UK Better Care programme. And his current research focuses on the use of data from secondary healthcare records to develop, evaluate and validate electronic clinical decision to support uh, decision support to improve patient safety and promote effective and efficient delivery of care. Over to you, Simon. Uh, so thanks very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as we've just heard, uh, I think today I'm going to talk really from my NHS position, which is in acute secondary care in England, to take one particular perspective on the future. But I hope that uh, that particular perspective will have wide resonance. I'm going to further narrow my scope and miss out swathes of interesting and important stuff that will undoubtedly shape the health data research landscape, such as using electronic healthcare records to enable clinical trials. I'm going to turn to really to the brief when we were asked to consider how we can use our experience from the pandemic to provide resilience in the face of future health shocks. Well, although not a pandemic with all that entails for society, there's clearly a profound need to respond to the demands of urgent and emergency care and really the closely related matter of inpatient care demands currently so evident across the NHS and indeed across, uh, across uh, the BBC, for example. The context of this is that prior to the pandemic, at least according to the Health Foundation, approximately 50% of healthcare, uh, of the healthcare budget was on inpatient care. As you know, the vast majority of beds open overnight are used for patients admitted through emergency pathways. Then a further 6% of spend is on, is on A&E and 21% on outpatient care. In short, secondary care costs a lot. And prior to the pandemic, acute hospitals had managed a 42% increase in urgent admissions over the previous 12 years. And all of that had been dealt with by shortening length of stay and increasing the use of same-day emergency care. The pandemic then created a step change in other stresses Backlogs, both overt and covert, I think, in the shape of waiting lists and in delayed presentation, which, when combined with rapid changes in the dynamics of the workforce, in the economics of health and in particular social care, as well as many other factors, means that we need to change the way in which care is delivered in hospital with a particular focus, I think, on efficiency. Now, in some segments, this can be seen going on right now in high volume, low complexity surgery. The bull is being taken by the horns, redesigning pathways and processes of delivery. 
that emergency care is really less susceptible to this type of deterministic approach. It's a, it's a really, it's a truly wicked problem, I suppose. Also, I think it's fair to say our systems, standards, guidelines, reporting, and regulation of quality, they were all based upon circumstances in which there was a fine balance of supply and demand, and that balance has really been significantly disrupted recently. Now, when talking of quality, and as some of you uh, on this call will know, I always turn to the features described by the Institute of Medicine, the top four of which are denominated on individual patients. So effective, safe, timely, patient-centered care. And they're always on the top of the slide. Equity and efficiency, those denominated on a population, they always come second. And in that, I think I give myself away as a hospital clinician. What the pandemic has taught us is how important efficiency is in the provision of effective, safe, timely, patient-centered and indeed equitable care. So I think now the question is, how is efficiency to be addressed for emergency attendances and the subsequent inpatient stay, when we are truly dealing with complexity in the stricter sense. It's a very different problem, as I've already mentioned, to the creation of highly efficient green pathways to deal with routine elective surgery, which is, to an extent, susceptible to regimentation. It seems to me that a major opportunity over the coming years is the use of data to gain insight and change behaviours to develop new knowledge to support clinical decision making and to develop technology that itself can support clinical decision making. For me, the application of this approach to urgent and emergency care offers great potential benefit, but it's truly challenging from data curation to analysis and on to implementation. At least in part, some of this is relates to the state of secondary care records that until only recently have been taking time to catch up with the primary health care their primary care electronic record. But of course, this is changing. How we use data and how we use computers to bring order to the complexity of urgent care pathways, for example, how we optimally identify and respond to physiological deterioration, how we define patients who could go, go home today and not tomorrow. These apparently simple tasks are eminently amenable to improvement. And certainly current attempts to address these apparently simple questions in an analog setting have not, I think, met any reasonable definition of success. So an ability to combine multidimensional data in the record in ways that wouldn't be possible in using simple scoring systems, I think that is a beginning to changing the way we practice. Equally, I think we must ensure that the impressive developments in the application of artificial intelligence, particularly to imaging, don't sit in isolation from the decision to order that investigation in the first place and the subsequent actions. And this is crucial if we're not simply going to move the problem to further encourage investigation really as displacement activity and not for patient benefit. I was wryly told by one of our acute physicians the other day that CTPA no longer stands for CT pulmonary angiogram, but CT per admission. This isn't laziness or irresponsibility or incompetence. It's driven by a series of expectations from patients, healthcare professionals and their groups, regulators. I think we have to start to use data to do better and not simply more. And we need to use the opportunity that doing better with computers will provide us to reframe the discussion with our patients, professionals and regulators to re redefine what excellence looks like and indeed what error looks like. I think what the pandemic has taught us is that a big approach coordinated across policymakers, researchers, providers, regulators, with, of course, the patients and the public can address a big problem. And of course, the health data research community in its different guises, the diverse approaches taken in the first five years of HDI UK and now into the second five years of HDI UK, they were, were crucial to the response to the pandemic. And I think it'll ju be just as important now. Now, finally, in, in considering how we address this, I think that the development of secure data environments in England certainly offers an opportunity to meaningfully address some of these issues. But to be successful, we need not only patients, but local healthcare leaders to understand how relevant this is to them. For example, interoperability can't be seen as something that's important to researchers or analysts, but it is safe, it's important to the safe and efficient delivery of a, using electronic healthcare systems, for example, to meaningfully in, implement clinical decision support at a national level. Interestingly, most of our patients actually assume that our systems are 
highly interoperable. There may be a discussion about whether and why we use data, but not whether it's fit for purpose. Leaders of healthcare organizations need to understand why this is all relevant to them. And I think we've still got some work to do, although I know Tim Ferriss and colleagues clearly have the bit between their teeth in this regard. So I think, in a slightly unconventional way, here's one potential moonshot that I think requires a coordinated approach and clear common goals across care delivery, quality improvement, and research. And I think we can learn a great deal from the approach that we took through the pandemic, whilst accepting that in some ways, this particular challenge that I'm offering you uh, is even more difficult. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, and we'll take questions uh, together as a panel at the end, but I, I can already see some interesting ones around prevention, uh, shifting towards prevention. So now I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Lynn Laidlaw. Lynn um, has been on a four year diagnostic od odyssey, uh, which really has prompted her involvement in health services, in health research as a public contributor. And she's now involved with multiple organisations and research teams across the UK, both as a public and patient representative, but also as a researcher. And I love her philosophy that um, people have a right to be involved in research that affects them and uses their data and that this involvement isn't a methodology. It's a values and principles led way of working that ensures that research meets everyone's needs. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you, Mary. And I want to thank you to HDR UK for the opportunity to be part of the discussion on such a crucial topic. And my comments are personal and from the perspective of a patient and public contributor and peer researcher. And I want to point out that I am not representative of the public, but I have tried to ensure that what I'm going to talk about reflects the conversations, priorities and concerns of the patient and public involvement I have been part of throughout the pandemic. And I've had the absolute privilege of being involved in a lot of COVID related data research with organisations such as the British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre, the EAST2 project in Scotland, the National Core Studies Immunity and COVID Immunology Consortium and the Academy of Medical Sciences. And I'm going to talk about what I perceive were the successes and challenges of data-driven research throughout the pandemic. And this topic is of particular interest and importance to me as I was classed extremely clinically vulnerable and had to shield as a result. And I often say that research is hope, to people like me living with conditions, and this felt particularly apt for all of us over the past three years. So I witnessed firsthand the huge pandemic research effort, the impact of team science, researchers and public contributors co collaborating. And data was hugely important to identify treatments and vaccines that help save millions of lives and quantify the risk of vaccine-induced blood clots, for example. And speed was of the essence, and I think that everyone stepped up a gear as a result and worked collaboratively. The unequal way the pandemic affected different groups exposed the limitations of existing data, I feel. And as a result, we understand the importance of accurately, accurately collecting data on things such as ethnicity. But I don't think we are there yet, especially when it comes to socioeconomic status. Why can't we ask and record if people think they have enough money to meet their needs, rather than using proxies such as postcode? And this was just one of the many proxies that there are in data research. But arguably, do we point out at the end of papers that these proxies exist and consider that job done because we've mentioned it, rather than working out ways to get rid of them? And I feel that one of the biggest challenges going forward is that we don't collect data from the person's point of view. And I saw on Twitter that, that someone had, had quoted one of my favourite things about data, that health data are humans with the tears wiped off. And this data is collected about us. And much of the COVID data research I was involved with concentrated on the severe outcomes, usually hospitalisation and death. And it's not that these outcomes aren't of interest, but so is health-related quality of life and years of healthy life. And I'm sure people living with the effects of long COVID feel that, they are, that their effects are severe. Which causes me to ask, do we concentrate on measuring what is cur currently measurable in routine data rather than asking people and understanding what is meaningful to them? 
And I feel that much of the conversation around involving in patients and the public in data research concentrates on trust and data security. And again, these are important topics. But the minimum I expect is that my data will be kept safe. And I would love us to move the conversation on to how much say people should have and what their data is used for. What research topics matter the most? Also, patient and public involvement in data research is more than inputting into the plain language summary. What say should public contributors to research have in things like data analysis plans or statistical analysis plans? And I feel that the COVID therapeutics research I've been involved with through the EVE2 project has been an exemplar in this regard. And I also feel that we need some data allyship and reciprocity. If researchers and companies are given even more access to my data, what access should I have? There is an unacceptable postcode lottery across the UK. In Scotland, for example, I can't access my primary care records, but I know that people in England can. And I think that the increased use of wearables for data research will fundamentally change the power differentials here because we'll be relying on people to actively choose to share their data rather than the passive collect collection of data about them. And I want to end with a few provocations and challenges. And as I say, I uh, like to call myself a peer researcher. And I was funded as part of a small team of two peer researchers, myself and Joyce Fox, and an academic rheumatologist, Charlotte Sharp, to co-produce qualitative research into the impact and experiences of people who live with autoimmune rheumatic diseases and had to shield. We were funded by Versus Arthritis and supported by the Centre for Epidemiology Versus Arthritis at Manchester University. And this research idea came from my absolute frustration that the research into shielding was mainly quantitative and didn't reflect what was important to me. And we wanted to bring this data to life and understand the personal context and nuance. And it was important that I wasn't seen as, as more, it, it was important to me to be seen as more than a data point. And I'm involved in the project, which is looking at developing a qualitative research data bank and personally feel that all large data projects should involve mixed methods and have a qualitative aspect. We are in the process of writing up the res results from our research. And one of our most striking findings reflects a theme I have heard constantly in PPI groups involved in COVID-19 data research, the communication of research findings. The participants in our research told us that they had been overloaded with information, but none of it was personalised enough to enable them to make personal risk benefit decisions, which reflected their unique situation. And I was involved in the Academy of Medical Sciences, Winter Pressures and Preparedness Reports, commissioned by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer. Our second report concentrated on the communication of research results and information about COVID. And how do we disseminate and mobilise the knowledge from data research in a way that meets the needs of the diverse communities, groups and people that require the information? Who do people want that information from? And what information do clinicians and other people require to enable them to fulfil that role? Who do we trust to inform us about the research findings that affect us and are trusted people different for specific groups? Is publishing in the Lancet, Nature and influencing policy enough? What metrics are important when it comes to sharing research results? If we had really thought about this, would disinformation about COVID and the vaccine have flourished in the way it did? Whose data research is it anyway? Who has the greatest need when it comes to really understanding the results from research that uses our data? It's all our data. I appreciate the utility of big data and the fundamental part it played in COVID-19 research and will continue to play in the future. But it's important not to rest in our laurels and we need to continually evolve and innovate in this field by understanding what is important to people. In the data research we undertake, the way the results are disseminated and what involvement patients and the public have in the conduct of data research. So thank you for listening and I hope we can have an open and honest discussion about these issues in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was wonderful. And I loved your, I shan't forget that, that data are humans with the tears wiped off. I definitely won't, won't forget that phrase. Thank you. And, and I take your point that putting some of the tears back on by understanding what's important to people is, is a really, is something we need to get right going forward. So thank you.
So lastly, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Professor Dame Jenny Harries. Um, I'm sure many of you know Jenny and the role that she played during the pandemic. Uh, she is the first chief executive of the UK Health Security Agency with a remit to protect the nation from external hazards, hazards to health. So thank you, Jenny, and your organisation um, for protecting us. And of course, Jenny was also deputy chief medical officer throughout the COVID pandemic and has played central roles in the UK's response to several significant public health incidents, including Ebola, Zika, MERS, the Novotel, shock attacks in Salisbury and currently MPOX. Thank you very much Jenny. Thank you very much Mary and I'm hoping you can hear me all right. On I'm on a mobile gadget but I think it's okay. So um, actually just picking up from where Lynn left off uh, is really interesting because every time she made a statement I, I was thinking of context in a different perspective and the value of these discussions is actually bringing those perspectives together uh, and I think important when we're considering uh, data research is actually what is possible in the context. So in, for just as an example, uh, Novichok and the, and the start of the pandemic, uh, there are potentially limitations to what can be achieved. But I think we should always aim for the best. Um, and in just say, thinking through what I would say is a few uh, points at the start of this conversation, um, I came up with three points which are actually not very specific data ones, but they relate to that. So I thought, what are the three lessons I have learned? And then perhaps just give some examples of what we're doing and, and how we've learned them. So the first one with uh, data research is, uh, and exactly as Lynn has said, actually, we're clearly on the same page, is it's not just what you do, but who you do it with. Uh, that may be a patient, for example, but uh, in the case of UK Security Agency at the moment, looking forward on some of our vaccine research, actually completely new ways of working uh, are developing with uh, the pharmaceutical industry uh, and I hope with academics too. So I think learning there. The second point is, again, Lynn has uh, precluded this, which is it's not my data or their data, which I think is the classic research approach. It's actually our data. Uh, it's everybody's. It's whether you're in the system in government, whether you are an individual patient in a community. And it is actually the power of owning the data between us, not that one bit of the system owns it, which is really important and has had real public health impact during the later phase of the pandemic. Um, and then I think the final point is that the pandemic has allowed us I think, to come out of our little silos and do things differently. Um, and we should not be fettered by um, historic clouds of uh, perceptions of things are impossible. Um, and I think both the previous speakers have noted this as well. There are things that we can do uh, within totally good governance around data, which we just have simply not attempted to do before. And we should not fall back into that business as usual way of working. So I was just going to talk about a few things that we're doing now, because I think they prompt and start to pull out the learning uh, and, and the opportunities. Uh, and they run from the COVID-19 dashboard, which UK to say still runs, um, uh, working on climate change research, uh, a different angle of, of health protection for us, um, looking at how we've used uh, new data and research uh, for a new outbreak, so new transmission dynamics for uh, MPOX, um, and then actually just what should a, a new health protection agency do in terms of being an exemplar? It was our agency is born in the pandemic, from the pandemic, and it must be the greatest opportunity for us to do brilliant research and use data. And indeed, one of our key uh, areas of responsibility is around surveillance uh, and data and analytic use. So I think just picking up the COVID-19 dashboard, um, obviously, we have used that uh, with public and leaders across government and the health uh, sector uh, to inform on the progress of the pandemic. And it's been a critical part of actually controlling the spread of infection. Um, by late 2020, our dashboard had had over 300,000 unique users every day and around 5 million hits a week. Uh, it was one of the most uh, accessed sites in the country. Um, that gives it a lot of power and authority. And I think it gives us a responsibility to use it uh, effectively. And it obviously developed over time. And I think there's an element here for us to all understand what is possible at which point. A pandemic is a 
is a real um, extreme event, uh, but it does highlight what we can do with data and research at different points. Um, but one of the things that it did do was pull together uh, data from uh, uh, a number of different sources, so uh, over 12 different uh, major sources by the end of uh, the pandemic, and we're still using it now. Uh, but it's also meant that those 300,000 people uh, routinely have uh, used the middle layer super output areas, so maps, which so the community level to understand. Now, by the time you mix that with uh, the data linkage which developed, it has meant that rather than have a national coverage figure for for example, for um, uh, vaccine coverage, it allows local uh, groups, individuals, particularly directors of public health, to um, assess how um, protected their local communities are and start to appropriately support communities uh, with concerns about vaccine or to ensure that they have adequate access if they are comfortable with receiving it. Um, given that that is has become the main protective intervention uh, for most people in the country. That is a critical point around uh, outbreak control. Um, and so one of the other things it's taught us is actually uh, the more people, this is the who we do it with, uh, we need to learn, the more people who understand some of the data opportunities and limitations is really important. So people may remember that during the pandemic, there was a bit of a, a furore on the front of the media and the, and the TV about how we were counting COVID-related deaths and whether it was reasonable to do so at seven days or 28 days or three months. Um, and it wasn't that there was a right or a wrong way. It's just that actually they tell us slightly different pictures. And the more people that understand that, the better it is. It also is important to understand that the denominator population for many, uh, for much of uh, many of our uh, statistics varies also. So, for example, for vaccine, which was absolutely critical, did we use an ONS estimate, Office of National Statistics estimate, when the last true estimate was 10 years prior. So it was uh, obviously a, a good estimate, but some way off uh, a, a recent assessment. Or did we use GP populations as uh, the uh, denominator to give us uh, a, an, an accurate record in relation to uh, where most people would be linking their health data. So these sorts of metrics are really vital to um, everybody's health, particularly to the individuals themselves. But if we don't have that prior understanding between before we go into an event or before we start discussing, for example, a health service issue, it becomes much more difficult to have an honest narrative and get successful outcomes from it. So one of the things we have done, of course, as we've come through is we've now changed that dashboard because what's bothering people this winter, both ministers uh, and uh, the public, is the fact that we've now, we're talking about twin demics. We're looking not just at COVID, but we're looking at flu as well and a number of other respiratory viruses. So we're changing those surveillance statistics to ensure that we are uh, keeping the data flowing and uh, that individuals can use that data freely uh, to uh, think through their own uh, particular areas of research. Um, one of the things, again, that we do is our modelling has progressed so far during this pandemic that the same mechanisms for uh, now casting and looking, forecasting, looking ahead to what might happen, albeit only on the parameters that we have available at the time, uh, are now used routinely to look at both national and regional um, and, and actually individual acute hospital predictions so that we can better manage uh, those uh, areas uh, of health service use. And of course, there have been numerous surveillance studies. We've had REACT, we've had ZOE, uh, with different ways of doing it. We've had the ONS study, we've had studies focused in care homes and health services as well. But I think if we then move on just to something like climate change very briefly, um, much of our work is carried out now in partnership with others. So uh, from local authorities through to national government. And in fact, we now do uh, early warning and response to extreme weather events, working with uh, colleagues, a partnership between the NIHR Health Protection Research Unit in Environmental Change and Health uh, with London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, UCL and the Met Office. So there are different partners to use going forward. 
Then we look at a new event. So uh, everybody, I'm sure, would be very familiar with the uh, MPOX, the, the monkeypox renamed uh, outbreak recently. And what we saw there was a completely different mechanism of transmission of a known uh, uh, pathogen. Um, and we have used, right at the start, put in a research protocol of all the areas that we didn't know about. Um, and one of the critical ones was using surveillance and then modelling and statistics to understand transmission dynamics. And then just a final point, I think, to open up the discussion about how should we do this really well for the future. Um, and um, we are trying to provide a new approach to this learning from the pandemic so that we have a, um, a, a common and bespoke suite of performant modern data and analytics tools, platforms and applications across the UK HSA. Not that it's sitting in one area, not that one part of the system owns a data set um, and that there is accountability for data throughout the life cycle from when you acquire it through storage, processing, control, transfer and retirement. And we are strong advocates of the FAIR principles for use of data, so findable, accessible, uh, accessible interoperable and reusable. Um, and we're also obviously developing not just in the UK, but working in international cooperation now and collaboration on uh, such a uh, unique, uh, but hopefully um, uh, uh, lifetime benefit um, operations such as the global pandemic radar, um, which uh, was announced by the PM in, in May 2021 to track COVID variants across the world, uh, but equally looking at how we can engage better governance for data so that more countries join, uh, join uh, together globally to use data and research in a positive way for public health outcomes. And I'll stop there, Mary. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you to all our speakers. So we've got about um, 20, 20 odd minutes for a discussion and we've had some great questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to divide them into kind of three areas um, along the pathway to impact. The first set of questions are around what kind of data should we be collecting? How should we be involving patients and the public in that collection of data? The kind of questions that Jenny and Lynn have been asking. The second um, is my uh, bias as, as Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor. I really want to, us to think about how we influence policy better with this data and how we work better in partnership with policymakers to actually make all this incredible data science change policy and practice. And the third around some of the questions that Simon raised in his talk, which is around implementation. So how do we actually make this count when we have clinical de uh, decision support tools? How do we actually implement them at scale so that we can change the way the health and social care system um, can um, influence patient outcomes? So I'm going to start with the kind of research and health system. We've had some good questions in the chat um, on this. So um, Anthony Chutter has um, asked around uh, questions around how we change from essentially it mo moving more to a national health service rather than national disease service, as the saying goes, to shifting more uh, emphasis and data collection around primary care and prevention uh, in order to ease pressure on secondary care. And I wonder, Simon, whether you have a, any reflections on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that in many ways, the primary care record is is actually significantly more advanced than secondary care record. It does offer, offer significantly greater opportunities um, uh, to, um, uh, to manage uh, risk, manage health, if you will. Um, but in order to then best understand um, what, um, the implications of everything that we do, then actually it's pretty important not to simply look at um, uh, hospital episode statistics, which is what we've got at the moment when it comes to going through into secondary care, but actually what, what is going on with an individual when they're admitted, actually adjusting for all of the consequences of, of the decisions that have been made uh, uh, upstream in, in healthcare. And the reason that's important, as I kind of alluded to, is that actually the, the spend is in secondary care. If you can actually impact upon secondary care, you can actually release uh, um, uh, funds, resource, people um, you know, to actually go even further upstream, you know, and whether that's in healthcare or my particular bias is in education in general and, and uh, as, a, as, as a worthwhile investment, but with a long, 
long lag. So I think it's about linking all of those things together is what we're talking about. Thank you. And another um, open to anybody, as, as we know, one of the real lack of data we have in the UK is around social care, which is another massively important part of the system. And I wonder if people have any reflections on how we can improve data from social care, how we can incorporate that into our research. Um, it's something that National Institutes of Health and Care Research are very exercised about, as I know NHSD, the old NHSD are, but um, your reflection is gratefully received. Lynn, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just when you were when you asked Simon um, the question about sort of illness prevention and, and and social care is just so inherent in, in this and socioeconomic status. And I'm a really big fan of Michael Marmot's work, you know, and and he really points at, points out that actually it's not that people make bad decisions; people make the decisions and make choices that, that they have the ability to make, which are which are bound by by their their life experiences you know whether they're working three jobs to to survive whether they've got access um to fresh food whether they can afford the electricity to cook it and and i think and, until we really understand the impact of the social de determinants of, of health and I understand the data around that from the person's perspective then i'm not sure that because what I hear from a lot of healthcare researchers is, oh, but, but but that's nothing to do with us and that's someone else's business. It's all our business. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and then another set of questions we've had are around the interconnectedness of data. So being able to see data across the whole system, not only to be able to link patient care records from GPs to hospitals to social care, but also to then use that linked record for, for research. I mean, obviously, it's a it's a part. We all want this. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have reflections on how close we are to that, or the positive steps we could do to get us closer. Because I think we all agree that would be a wonderful thing. Mary, shall I Jenny? come in there? I've, Please, Jenny. Yeah, Jenny gadgetry, I, I can't put my hand up electronically, so um, <laughs> I will just join in. Um, actual fact, I might just go back to the point before as part of an example for this because. Um, from my perspective, uh, observation going through the pandemic, actually, the um, care home, the social care data is, despite the problems, has been the area of fastest improvement throughout throughout the pandemic. Now, it often doesn't look that way. Um, and it signals, I think, the difference that was there between the care sector and the health sector previously. And I'm a passionate advocate on the care side because this is a continuum. It's 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 a, an individual in uh, who who has experiences whether they're in health or social care and we need to understand that in the round but in fact what so there is a care observatory uh, kicking off uh, shortly there is um we through the pandemic and through some of the research we managed to develop a system for putting a unique identifier so that we could tag uh, if you like a patient anonymized patient record or care home resident record and therefore be able to get really useful information which allows us to improve the care pathways or to give public health advice so I think that's an important one what we have seen and this is one of the learning points I think I, I'm keen that we don't lose within the the legislation for the pandemic uh, there were copies and I can never remember what the copy stands for but effectively it's patient information uh, uh, linkage which we have used really successfully between uh, the individual vaccination status uh, health service care and admissions um, and uh, that is something that we've never achieved on that scale and level before uh, to the extent that uh, along with the testing data as well that at the peak of the pandemic we were able to evaluate new vaccine effectiveness better than the individual pharmaceutical companies were on a public level so I think we have achieved a lot the trick then is to make sure that we can do that and don't lose that capacity routinely. Thank you, Jenny. That's so two really positive news stories. Thank you. And I think everybody, I'm sure, at this conference will agree that the copy notices during COVID were absolutely transformational for enabling the data research that we saw. And the trick is how we how we establish that on a permanent footing. We've certainly um, just very recently um, got permission to use that the copy notice to look at winter pressures on the NHS and social care because it's so related to COVID. So, so that kind of wide data access can, can stay for that which is great. Um, Simon, do you have any other reflections on this issue of, of 
just to uh, back up, uh, this, this, yeah, the, the residential care home piece is incredibly important. If we think about uh, it from my, from everybody's perspective, but if we think about the secondary care perspective I was making earlier on, patients coming into hospital and p- p- patients coming out of hospital, residential care homes are absolutely central to that. It's the health foundation stuff around the 5% greatest um, kind of uh, uh, consumers of healthcare uh, and what have you. And if we, it seems to me a missed opportunity. It's starting to come through as we just, but a, a missed opportunity to genuinely impact not only in in the way that we deliver care, but the way we actually receive care. Because actually, most people don't want to be shipped into hospital and and uh, end up with significant loss of function, which is inevitably associated um, with regards to that. Continue. I mean, the shared care record work. The secure data it has to the secure data environment work has to be linked to the shared care record work because we're talking about individuals. We're not talking about particular aspects of the care. When we treat patients, we actually find out about their social care, their primary care, their secondary care, their tertiary care. We treat them like that. So it is a false narrative um, to be uh, focusing from a research perspective or a connected record. Uh, perspective to say we're going to focus on this or, or that that aspect. So I think this is going to be crucial work, and for our research to mirror the the care, the way that we deliver care. And and, and at the moment we're not managing to do that because we're not quite managing to connect up the data assets that actually are available. Thank you, Simon. Now, a couple of questions for, um, I'll initially start with Lynn um, around patient trust and public trust in data and who owns it. So a question from Nigel Burns on, um, is it really our data? I think this is reflecting Jenny's um, comment in her talk. I suspect that most patients consider that it is their data and resolving the issue of who owns the data is critical to the wider issues of trust and willing compliance and ultimately the most effective use of healthcare data. Presuming ownership is, I suspect, a real irritation to many people. So perhaps um, I'll ask Lynn to come in first and then Jenny, because you've obviously stimulated this debate. <laughs> yeah, so I I can't look at this question without thinking about it in terms of power, in, in terms of actually who has the power here, who has the power to decide what data is collected about us, whether we have access to that that data, the inference that that is put on that data, what what our data is is used for, and you know, I think it it's all our data. So that says to me that there needs to be some kind of collective action and and and, and decision making here that that I'm just not seeing. You know, I, I think as a as a public contributor, I can't get involved unless someone invites me. To be involved, you know. Someone said this morning, if you're not, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. And I think that we, in in all of us, there is some really. I mean, it was interesting what what happened was it last year where people were given the opportunity to opt out their data because stuff was trying to get to get rushed through, and a lot of people did. And I think that this is a nettle that that has to be grasped about actually who whose data is it. Who owns it, and who should get to decide what, what what is done what is done with it? And I'm not sure we've had those conversations yet. Yeah. Very important ones to have. Thank you, Lynn. Jenny. Yes, um, and I realised I've, I've potentially lit, lit a, a small fire I never intended to, because actually where I was coming from in my thinking, and I realised many people on the uh, on the webinar will be uh, starting from an individual patient point, which is entirely, uh, uh, as Lynn has just described, a really important area. But one of the, the sort of professional bugbears I have, if I like, and many of my colleagues will be guilty of it, is that in order to get to the next academic publication, routinely, historically, what's happened is you get the data, you hang on to it, you wait till you've got a nicely finished document, and then you push it out into the public space and get the brownie points. Now, I think that is not what we should be doing. We should be giving 
credit and accolade to uh, institutes, organisations, research groups who share that information at the earliest possible robust opportunity. And we have seen that because everybody was on a mission, the same mission with the COVID pandemic. People have been prepared to do that. And I think what we mustn't do is allow that data to get withdrawn, go back, because we we, we learn more slowly. We have uh, less opportunity to implement changes quickly to to save lives and to help people in the quality of, of life. And and if I can, just one other o- a point, which is linked between them and these other conversations. Um, I chaired a uh, the Sage subgroup for care during uh, the second part of that group's existence. Um, uh, in, partly in order to pick up Lynn's point, which is this qualitative versus quantitative point, which is we tried to do a health economic assessment, if you like, so that we could have some tangible information for insurers. I know this seems a long way from the, the individual themselves, but actually we know that many of those individuals, if you withdraw care or you uh, you cease uh, visiting, for example, which was a critical balance point around infection control, actually the the risk to their physical health was potentially much greater for many than it was from the infectious disease themselves. But one of the difficulties in some of the groups of individuals, so Lynn can quite ably engage uh, and is doing so on her contribution. Of course, many individuals who have been most affected will find it more difficult to engage and it needs specialist uh, enablement and support. And I think that's an important area when we're thinking through some of our most vulnerable uh, patient groups. Thank you, Jenny. Good. And some new questions have come in, um, which beautifully, I'm, I'm going to, sorry, David Seymour, um, I'm going to avoid the question about Biobank because um, <laughs> I think we could spend all day talking about how long it took to get access to Biobank's GP data. Um, and one reflection on what you just said, Jenny, um, before I worked in the Department of Health, I was head of population health at the Wellcome Trust and spent a lot of time trying to fund more sustainably cohorts. And one of the things we really wanted to do was to get a DOI number for every cohort and data owner so that when pe- other people use that, their data or those data, they also got credit for being the data collectors. Um, and I think that would really help change um, openness and transparency in, in use of data. So I'm going to um, not ignore the big bosses uh, question, which is Andrew's, uh, and it partly because it completely chimes with where I wanted to take the discussion next, which is what do we do when we have this great research? How do we enable this um, collaboration that we saw during COVID between policymakers, systems leaders and researchers on data questions? And how do we make sure that this happens in peacetime and not just for a pandemic? I have my own reflections on this, um, partly because Andrew, uh, HCI UK and Department of Health are working exactly on this right now um, on around winter pressures um, because we want to ensure that collaboration continues. But any reflections from the panel um, on how we make this happen, particularly Jenny, thing is it? Definitely yes, your um, job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting, actually, Mary, because because on my list of things to do is go and speak with you and your boss as well, because even when we're all really keen and I think anybody online, hopefully will get the vibe through this, that I, certainly as a, as a public sector senior representative, I'm really keen that we do this. It's actually not quite as easy as it sounds, as I think we all we all uh, found out. So. Um, One of the things I'm doing, if I go back to uh, uh, the wider preventive agenda, so going forward, uh, I am very sure uh, my organisation needs to be working with pharma in a completely different way, all properly governance from the public sector side, but actually doing the horizon scanning of what is possible in public health terms, not simply what somebody decided to develop as a new vaccine or a new therapeutic. Um, And to do that, and I think this is the critical point, we have to maintain those relationships in, and I don't like the word peacetime, no. but I use it. But you know, in, in as a regular professional commitment, um, and I think that it, so actually, although it might feel quite stilted, I think we have to maintain the connections and what you uh, in Department of Health, myself in UKHSA, and many other places need to do is maintain that relationship uh, uh, with academia as well, and it is our responsibility to make those connections in a way which everybody understands. One of the problems is everybody was willing to help, every single research unit, every single pharmaceutical company, because it was such a big thing. 
the biggest problem was finding the front door to make the system work. So we are actually actively trying to make front doors for various groups. And I think what we need between us to do is build a row of houses effectively and different parts of the system can go through different front doors and we'll make sure the rooms connect at the back. Final point is um, actually the research outputs that we've achieved, um, I think how they're presented to inform policy and the timing is really important. So the care subgroup actually had special dispensation to go straight to ministerial decision making because the risks to uh, those particularly vulnerable uh, residents was, was noted. So as soon as there was some really robust output, I could actually take it into a ministerial discussion. Um, but I think actually how we use the data. So one of the key things around the dashboard, that was we've created national armchair epidemiologists from a dashboard, but actually we used all sorts of different visualization tools because some ministers, for example, can see things one way, just the same as the rest of the population. If you present an outcome or data in different ways, you stand a better chance of being able to translate that through and for people to understand the finding and the importance of it. So I think it's not just what we do or how we do it, it's actually what is this product that we're sharing for changes in policy as well. Thank you, Jenny. And I think your analogy of a front door is a very useful one. And it's certainly something that, um, as you know, we're, we're talking about with our new areas of research interest for the Department of Health. Uh, and these are intended to be big, uh, complex policy issues which the Department and NHS England are struggling with. Um, prevention and early intervention for chronic disease, reducing compound pressures on the NHS and social care and the health and social care workforce of the future are our three big topics where we're looking to work much more in collaboration with the wider research community and bring together policymakers um, and service leaders from NHS England in order to get that collaborative relationship uh, going around those issues in the same way that we did for COVID, but in a, in a much less uh, pressured environment, we hope, and with people not having to work every second of every day uh, to do it. And a, a data infrastructure around each of those three areas will be critical to delivering that. Um, and as some of you will know, we had a, a very rapid research call from HDR UK, uh, which closed last week uh, for data analysis on uh, winter pressures on the NHS and social care had an absolutely incredible response from the community, way more applications than we've expected to receive. And we'll be buddying the successful research teams with government analysts and policymakers across, including UKHSA, actually. We've had volunteers for, uh, of analysts from UKHSA to be involved as well um, as Department of Health and ONS, so that we get that relationship um, around these critical issues. Last couple of minutes, I want to turn to Simon to talk about the third topic, which is we've got great stuff. We've got great data science solutions. How do we get that working in real life in the health and care system? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that part of that is that is built up front in the research solutions um, and building the infrastructure that, that you have to have the level of interoperability across systems and across uh, the de definitions that are used commonly across all of all healthcare systems, all healthcare records, if you will, that are mean meaningful to individuals, but also that that allow um, systems to interoperate, so that you can lift a clinical clinical decision support that works in in a in a given setting or in given settings in a well validated. I see you've just got the cat arrived. <laughs> uh, so so um, it, and then. Uh, rapidly roll that out uh, in ways that don't need repeated in-depth validation. I think that's that's absolutely crucial. And again, that comes to the work that we've we've talked about with regards to the uh, SDEs, the shared care records. There needs to be convergence, really, of 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 of, of these data assets. We're not we're a very long way from there, we, but we are actually starting, knowing that that journey needs to be addressed. It needs to be made meaningful to patients, most importantly, but to healthcare professionals and healthcare organisations. We need to answer the questions that are that are causing problems for all those groups. Thank you, Simon. And that beautifully brings us back to our first topic, which is how do you create this interconnected data infrastructure across the care system? I want to give the last word to Lynn, um, because the patients and public should always have the first and the last word. So, <laughs> Lynn. 
Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to say on, on this topic that public contributors, recent public contributors aren't a free good and that we need to be an integral part of all of this. I mean, I've done some policy work with the Academy of, of, of Medical Sciences. I was actually part of a bid that was um, put in for the winter preparedness work that, that, that you talked about, Mary. And, you know, and, and we're doing doing a bit of work on research sustainability at the moment. And if you want patient and public to be involved in this work, then that needs to be planned for and it needs to be resourced because it's absolutely and totally fundamental. I, I think if you really want trustworthiness in whatever, things should be done with us, not for us. Completely agree. And I think bringing it back to HCR UK, that's one of the beautiful things about HCR UK, that certainly every application that we had for our winter pressures call, it had to have patient public involvement. We had two members of the committee who were PPI experts um, who got as much weight as anyone else in the committee. So, um, and as a result, the things we funded, we hope, will be trustworthy as well as useful and scientifically robust. Thank you, everybody, so much for your contributions and for the comments and questions in the chat. Sorry, we couldn't do every single one of them, um, but hopefully that's given us some enthusiasm and positive thoughts of uh, learning from all of our lessons going forward. I think we are in a better place than we were pre-pandemic, uh, despite the pain we went through. Um, and I think everybody is so willing to build on what we've learned and go forward that, that we're in a good place. Thank you, everybody. And come back in quarter of an hour for global health. Bye.